Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and our special program on community matters. And that is that elections are coming on up and we intend to bring all of the latest insight into that election to you all. So we got three more months before the election. And today we are very fortunate to have as our special guest, the senior member of the Hawaii Congressional Delegation. It's my pleasure to welcome to our show, Senator Brian Schatz. Hello, Brian. Hey, nice. Governor, how are you? Nice to see everybody on this show. I'm pleased to well, participate. Well, you know who's on the show to uh, join with me. We have this morning, obviously, Chad Blair, the uh, political guru from Civil Beat, yeah. who, by the way, is going to be up at the Democratic Convention, they tell me, right? Yep. Thank, thank, welcome, Chad. Thanks. I'll be, we, I'll be chasing the senator for quotes. <laughs> well, yeah, tie them down. We got Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii. He's their guru. And of course, we have the prophet Jay Fidel. So Jay knows what's happening everywhere. So you got a real good panel listening to you, Brian, along with all the people out there. So Senator, tell us, tell us about politics at the higher echelons in the on the national level. What, from your perspective, is uh, going on? Well, the last, I guess, about six weeks were among the most emotionally wrenching uh, for uh, people in the Senate, especially because, you know, Joe Biden considered himself a creature of the Senate. He always said that this was his home, professionally speaking. And still, whenever he visited with us, he would actually say, I still consider myself a senator. And so this transition from Biden to Harris was, I guess, especially gut wrenching for a lot of members. Um, and I think it was pretty tough for the country to watch because we, a lot of people were very frustrated at our inability to mount an effective campaign uh, against Donald Trump. And so um, a couple of things happened. I mean, I, I don't have to go through the, the sort of the sequence of events. We all watched it unfold. But I will say that two things happened uh, maybe unexpectedly well. One is that Kamala Harris has been underrated and uh, underappreciated as a politician, and she exceeded expectations. Everybody thought that this was going to be, okay, let's make a make a transition, but maybe Kamala is not the ideal candidate. Turns out Kamala is the ideal candidate to unite the Democratic coalition. And I think the other thing we underestimated was the kind of ferocity and pent-up demand in the anti-Trump coalition, which basically was dormant because they didn't feel like they had the standard bearer that they wanted. And now there are a bunch of people who are essentially demanding that one or the other of these two men step down. And once the Democratic Party showed its ability to respond to circumstances and function like a regular political party, heck, um, voters, independent voters in particular, are rewarding us for that. Well, wow, thank you. So we got a question from the from Chad. Yeah, thank you, Governor. You know, I wonder if you could just tell me a little bit more about what went on behind the scenes, as far as you know, regarding persuading Joe Biden to to not run again. I mean, you're hearing things like Nancy Pelosi being a central player and recognizing what's at stake, not just the White House, but the, the, the two houses, the House and the Senate. But also you're hearing the Republicans using words like coup and, and undemocratic uh, and, and not elected, meaning Harris didn't technically run in the primaries. I guess that's twofold questions. Are there some lingering bad feelings there that Biden, boy, what a what an end to his career? Let me let me start with the last thing. I think um, are there bad feelings? Sure, among operatives. And if I were Joe Biden himself, I would have you know some quite bad feelings. But among voters and grassroots activists and donors and the people who kind of make the Democratic Party work, um, the people who were most fervently in favor of Joe Biden staying in the race stayed with him because they're loyal. And once Kamala was. Um, the presumptive nominee, they're also loyal to that. And so I'm not terribly worried about the potential disunity in the party. At the kind of feelings level, I think there are a lot of you know challenges because this is this is very, very tough and personal stuff. There's a 
thing, which I think it was John Radcliffe used to say, um, hmm. everything in Hawaii is political except politics, which is personal. I'm not sure if that was John Radcliffe or John Wahey, but it sort of <laughs> felt like that. Um, and then I guess, you know, the reporting was all correct. I do think it probably underestimated the role of um, Senate Democrats, um, not because I particularly covet being in a position of of, of being like cr critical in this historical moment, but because he, he, you know, he really cares what the Senate thinks. And we were very mostly quiet, not like House members, um, about our views. And so they were all communicated politely, respectfully, uh, and directly and, and confidentially. And so, so I thought that part of it maybe is a slightly underreported, but perhaps by design in terms of how Chuck Schumer viewed what was going to be most effective. Um, and then finally, look, I, I think if you are left complaining about the process by which another party selected its nominee, then you're probably losing, right? Because you're stipulating to the idea that you don't like this nominee, you wish they had a different nominee, you wish there were a different outcome. And so you're just kind of whining uh, about procedure. Um, the Democratic Party voted through its delegates to make Kamala Harris the nominee. It was obviously an unusual process, but it wasn't like a planned unusual process. It was a recognition that Joe Biden would best serve the country by focusing 100% on being the president of the United States, and Kamala would best serve the country by focusing on becoming the next president of the United States. Colin, you got uh, anything from the, sure. the lofty heights of Manoa? Senator, let me follow up on something you just said, which is uh, that, that uh, Vice President Harris has been really underestimated. And I think a lot of us share that that idea. I mean, I think that explains some of the nervousness around, you know, the, the idea that she would become the next nominee. But, you know, she really seems to have exceeded all expectations. So why do you think that was? Why do you think she was underestimated? And why do you think she didn't really seem to get much of the spotlight um, in the last few years of the Biden administration? Well, the, the question of the spotlight is a question of the Constitution. The vice presidency and the lieutenant governorship are you get as much spotlight as you can get, but it's never your fault if you're not in the spotlight. You're you're supposed to be available um, in case the uh, chief executive is unable to serve and you serve. Uh, you can try to do important projects. And and if you're good at it, you do. I think Sylvia Luke is a good example of someone who's distinguished herself, but she's still not the governor. Right. And so I don't think it's the vice president's fault that she had a limited portfolio. That's the way the Constitution is set up. Um but I think she's been underestimated for two reasons. First, there's just some basic racism and sexism, and the majority of pundits, not here, but pundits in Washington, are white dudes of a certain age. And so it's understandable that they're not being affirmatively racist and sexist, but they don't see themselves in her in the same way that they would see themselves in a Josh Shapiro or a Tim Walls or anyone else. Um, and then I also think it, it's the primary calendar, right? She did not do well when she ran for president, because they were starting in Iowa, right? Mm -hmm. And if they were starting in California or Nevada or Arizona, people might have an entirely different view about how good she is at politics. And so um, John knows this very well. I certainly know this as well. Whether people think you're good at politics is is almost a an accident of history and not necessarily some inherent tra traits that you have or don't have. She's the right person for this moment. And that's why she's excellent. And I also think that we're, people underestimated like how much fun she has. And there was pent up demand, not just to kick Trump in the butt, but also just to make politics a little bit joyous again. And, and she's pretty good at cultivating that joy. It's music. It's it's laughing hard. It's having a uh, a, a spouse that actually wants to be there and support their um, principles. So I just think the joy is back in politics. How about you, Jay? She's the happy warrior. So she gets up in front of 10,000 people and you see somebody strong, but you also see somebody who really likes doing it, who's happy, who engages with you. She touched me. I, I don't know if this works uh, or it's important, but she touched me and she spoke to me. She was speaking to me and I stood up from my couch and I went immediately and wrote her a check immediately. Um, that's and that's how I think she raised so much money so quickly. Um, so she's got a different style. But, you know, this is a battle of rhetoric. 
Uh, it's a battle of name calling and responding to name calling and all kinds of insinuations and uh, innuendos and um, name calling. And yesterday, uh, Trump called them all down and the media all came to Mar-a-Lago where he rambled on for an hour and lied throughout um, that time. Uh, and then uh, Kamala Harris was going to give a speech and she gave a speech, but the media didn't cover that. And so you have a, a media question. And I think, uh, I guess my question for you is, does the delegation, do you play a role in straightening all this out, in speaking to the media, um, in you know balancing those, those rhetorical um, competitions? Um, I mean, I think the answer is yes, I but I think it's all hands on deck. I mean, the model um, that worked um, under the Obama campaign was that we communicated not casually and not sort of superficially to people, um, but to tell them directly, Wisconsin is going to be won or lost by one vote per or two votes per precinct across the state, as an example, right? Um, you know, I won by 1,728 votes um, uh, for the United States Senate. Lots of people uh, win by... In just exceedingly tiny margins. And so the media is going to do what it's going to do and the cable news is going to be what it is. But I also think one of the things that we need to do is engage people in conversations within their families and their social networks. And I mean social networks in the in the pre-iPhone sense of the word, people we all know. And that's why, frankly, the Democratic Party of Hawaii is so strong is because we still have what people call the coconut wireless. People actually do talk to each other and ads are important and money is important and organizational heft is important, but reputation is what gets people elected or unelected. And so I think we've got a lot of work to do at the organizing level. And yeah, sure, my, my particular role is now I got to do more cable hits. It is actually one of my least favorite parts of the job. It sort of chews up three-ish hours to get ready for it, to go down to the studio, to do the whole thing. And I got other things that I like to accomplish. But I also know that um, I, I can sometimes be an effective messenger on behalf of our party. And so I, I told my as soon as it was Kamala, I said, all right, load me up. Well, let's do Jen Psaki. Let's do Chris Hayes. Let's do, you know, Maureen Joe. Let's go, you know. And I think that, I'm emblematic of everybody else. Like you jump off the couch and send some money. Someone signs up to, um, you know, knock on doors or do a phone bank or whatever it is. But across the country, organically, everybody's saying, OK, I've got a role here and democracy is at stake and we still might lose. But I sure as hell I'm going to fight as hard as I can and at least have the serenity to know that I did everything that I could uh, to try to make Kamala Harris and Tim Walz president. You know, you mentioned Jen Psaki. Uh, um, she's my favorite podcast. And uh, lo and behold, there's Jen Psaki and you. Um, and I was so impressed with what you were saying. I told you, I really love that, that uh, uh, you know, that, that interview. And I said to myself during that interview, gee whiz, you know, uh, to have Brian on there, to have Hawaii credited with these remarks from Brian, that's just fabulous. I, I want more, Brian. And it's not just me, and it's not just Hawaii. It's the country wants more from Hawaii. So all I can do is encourage you to, to keep up the cable. The other the other thing I wanted to ask, last thing, last thing, John, if you don't mind. Got about four minutes left, so you better quickly. If I got add. four minutes, I got four minutes. <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. It's a short question. With all of this and the popularity and the energy and the happy warrior and it's like taking the rainstorm off little Abner, you know, it's all of a sudden we feel liberated from what Trump was you know, giving us. The, the question is, are we going to see a blue wave? Not only Harris and uh, and, and Tim uh, Waltz, but, but Congress, but the Senate, um, but the House. Are we going to see a blue wave? And And if we are going to see a blue wave, how can she accelerate that? Um, I have no idea whether we're in a in an environment where we're you know we could lose, we could very well lose, we could win by a little, and I suppose we could win by a lot. I would assign a lower likelihood um, to winning by a lot than either losing by a little or winning by a little. I think the country is polarized. This is a tough, certainly for the Senate, it's a tough electoral map. 
because we could win the popular vote 53 47 and still lose the senate because of the particular senate seats that are exposed in this cycle so no i'm not going to predict a blue wave i will say that 90 days is both you know an instant in politics but it's also a long time so part of what we have to be prepared for is some bad days some bad polling results some mini scandal or perceived scandal or the vice president says something in some you know inartful way because nobody's perfect like we're going to have some bad days and um my view is to kind of keep that in the back of our mind but not let it um curb our momentum because we're now on a couple of straight weeks of momentum and frankly people like to be part of a winner people like to be part of a fun thing they um like would you rather be at a trump rally or a harris rally just objectively as an event and now the answer is well i'd rather be at the harris rally and frankly the hillary rallies versus the trump rallies like obviously my politics was with hillary but it looked like the trump people were having more, more fun right and now the trump people are just kind of sitting there they leave early he rambles it's kind of funky they get some you know john voight and and kid rock and whatever and we got like kendrick and you know what i mean there's a generational and vibrational shift that i am very, very pleased to be a part of. We're going to thank you for your time. And I know I promised that you would be free to uh, pursue the business of Hawaii uh, by 11.20. So, aloha. <laughs> and Thanks, mahalo. you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you, thank you so much for coming, Senator. See you on Anytime, the campaign go. trail. Okay, I'll see you. Take care. Aloha. You heard our senior congressional... Um, leader and his take on what's happening uh nationally so i mean um maybe i should just ask that you know like um we'll start with with colin you know colin i what what does all of this do i mean what what, what do you what's your pro, pro, prognostication boy i mean i i agree with most of what <clears throat> senator shot said i i um I mean, there is something in politics about momentum, and Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz really do seem to have that at the moment. I mean, I think the sense of excitement and fun, I, I didn't think they'd be able to accomplish this. I mean, I was one of the folks who really was worried about Harris and divisions within the party and her uh, ability to be an, a, an effective presidential candidate. And I think she's proven any of us who had those questions wrong. Um, I think that you know, there's just a sense of... Uh, that, that this could be the winning team um, and nothing succeeds like success. So, I mean, I, I don't, I, I think they could still lose. Um, I think that it's very close. I mean, the polling average I saw today was just, she's ahead by two percentage points. I don't think, you know, I, I don't think it's gonna grow significantly um, from that, maybe, maybe a little bit, but I, you know, with only three months left, it sure is nice to feel like the, um, uh, the, the Harris campaign has the momentum going forward here. I mean, I know that 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 I think what that should give Democrats some confidence that um, at the very least, this would be a, a very close race, a very close loss. I um, mean, I think that you could say the opposite for the Trump campaign. I mean, I think the, the press conference he gave was disastrous. Um, I mean, it wasn't different than what Trump has said in the past, but I think he sounded even more rambling um off topic um you know it, it was back to grievance politics um and, and trump you know if he just hammered on the economy all day and stuck with that um you know and, and remained somewhat disciplined and we think we saw a little bit of a disciplined trump in that uh debate with joe biden but he seems to have gone back to um why don't you get in on this chad let's see what the you know see what the observer of the process you know it was just not even five or six weeks ago that Joe Biden gave that disastrous debate. And then it was not even a month ago that a bullet almost killed Donald Trump. And the the pace at which things are happening, I think there's so much that could happen in these next 90 days that are just flat out unpredictable. That includes the war in Gaza, as well as uh, other areas in the Middle East. That includes what's happening in Ukraine, a new development there invading Russia. The economy, we did see a stock market drop and talk of recession again. Here's another thing. We actually haven't heard directly from Kamala Harris except at these rallies. She has yet to give a press conference. 
Trump's press conference was absolutely a disaster. I completely agree with Colin, but we haven't heard from her. And in the past, she has been She's definitely better than she was four years ago, but she she tends to ramble, the, the word salad and so forth. And so I think it's still highly unpredictable. And if there's anybody that knows how to take advantage of the unpredictable, it's Donald Trump. Well, Jay, you want to jump in on this? You know, I, I agree. Anything could happen in 90 days. I mean, this is an infinitely long period of time. And on the other hand, I, I think that uh, whatever, you, whatever you say about uh, her ability to deal in a press conference, um, she's rational, and Trump is not rational. Trump is in a, in a major visible decline. If you thought that Biden was in a decline, well, Trump is in a decline of another kind, but it's pretty serious where he gets the facts wrong. It's also serious where the press doesn't call him on it and gets away with it like he did yesterday. So um, my my feeling is that she heard you say that, and she saw the article in the Times yesterday about how she better get out there and do press conferences. And she has rational advisors around her much more than the acolytes that Trump has around him. And they're going to tell her what you said. They're going to tell her what's in the New York Times. They're going to tell her, hey, it's it's time to avoid the word salad and get out there uh, in, in a, a press conference and answer the questions. And the, <clears throat> the, the, the difference will be enormous between how she handles it and about how he handles it. Let me ask uh, Colin, how important do uh, you think her choice of uh, vice president was in all of this? And what's being brought to the table? There's two ways to think about this. I mean, the first is that vice presidents don't actually matter a whole lot. Um, and I think there's truth to that. Um, I don't think they deliver the election. But I think Tim Waltz was a, was a great choice. I mean, I know a lot of people, sort of more conservative Democrats, were hoping that it might be Josh Shapiro, um, or Mark Kelly from Arizona. But I think what Tim Waltz brings is a certain cultural understanding of, of rural America. Um, and I, I think that's really going to help in the upper Midwestern states and rural Pennsylvania, the places that she needs to win. I mean, he is just like her, a happy warrior. I mean, I think that that, that, that personal compatibility is one of the reasons she picked him. Um, but he also is deadly effective. I mean, he has the ability to skewer the Republicans in a sort of Minnesota nice style, and that is a rare talent. Um, and I think that that is who she needs on the ticket. So I think I think Waltz is gonna is gonna help her in in places that might be skeptical of voting for for Kamala Harris. Um, I think the Republican attempts to paint him as a San Francisco liberal have been really clumsy. I, I really can't see any of that sticking. And I think the contrast between him and J.D. Vance is, is very stark. I mean, I think that what, I, what I've seen so far seems to be that Vance has been dragging the, the Trump ticket down and, and Waltz really seems to have boosted Harrison in the right ways. So, Chad, let me ask you an unfair question, you know. You know, the the, the uh, Trump used to run this show called "You're Fired." You know? and <laughs> yeah, so at, at what it. point? Yeah. At what point does he call the in Vance and say, "If he let go of J.D. Vance," and I agree with Colin completely that it's been a disappointment. Oh boy, talk about the jokes and the memes uh, for J.D. Vance. Um, Trump will let him go in a heartbeat if he thinks that he can win, and 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 don't rule out Nikki Haley, a woman, a woman of color. Uh, and actually a pretty good campaigner who did fairly decently in, in the primaries, all things considered. He'll let her go just like that. And what will that do? He will. That's what he does. He changes the narrative. He seizes it. We'll see whether that happens or not. But yeah, I think he'll, you're fired, JD. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, you see that, that there is that possibility? Well, I, of I do. This is the most unpredictable man in all of political history in the United States of America, perhaps <laughs> world politics. You bet he's going to do something like that, especially if the polls, I mean, checking Nate Silver, it looks like the two have crossed, right? Uh, Harris finally is went a little bit on top. Harris, and you know, it's the it's the the line, and 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 Trump. Nothing's more important than Trump than numbers. That's why he's so upset, saying there were more people at the January sixth insurrection than there were the Martin Luther King speech. Uh, I have a dream. I mean, my God. But yeah, you bet he will. <laughs> okay, Jay. So one of the things Democrats, you know, uh, get accused of is this. Uh, this idea that they don't know how to play hardball. 
the, I mean, I mean, obviously the master of hardball would be would be Trump. But so, I mean, how how effective is weird in this in in this in this situation? There was an article about that this morning in uh, either the Post or the Times, and it is very effective. Uh, it is not name calling in the in the Trumpian style of name calling. Uh, it's different. It's um, and it works, and it has worked really well, and it has stuck. Um, so I think it's going to have a huge effect on the election going forward, and I think there'll be other words like that. It won't be insult per se, but it'll be mm, you know a kind of a characterization of the man and his uh, lying and his machinations and and so forth. I'd like to add one other point about about um, uh, Tim Walz. If you if you just look at him, uh, I would have to agree that vice president candidate doesn't mean that much. You look at the leader, you look at the at the president per se. But here we have a comparison going on. It's not just Tim Waltz. It's Tim Waltz versus J.D. Vance. And there's going to be all kind. There is already all kinds of media attention on that comparison. Now, the problem for Trump. Chad, I think, is for Trump, it's transactional. Mm. He's got these um, billionaires giving him a lot of money, hundreds of millions at least. And he's promised them, um, you know, Seelan is his name, whatever, I forget his name. Mm -hmm. um, he has promised him all this money. Uh, and, and so maybe Elon Musk. Um, and if he pulls Vance out, if he does the apprentice firing routine on him, which may be rational and indicated given you know the way the polls have crossed, um, he may lose that money. At the end of the day, Trump is transactional. So the question, and we discussed this the last time, the question is whether, what do you care about more? Does money lead to votes or do quality candidates lead to votes? Some people believe that money is more important because you can convince the, the voting public of anything if you throw it at them over and over and over again in propaganda promotionals. And so he may decide to hold on to him. If he does that, this comparison will hurt him. Interesting thoughts. Now, how much of this affects Hawaii's little elections? You know, and that we have tomorrow, um, well, whenever this plays, but I think it's August uh, 10th will be the uh, primary election in Hawaii. And uh, so, okay, uh, you guys were around the last time two years ago when the Republicans seemed to make a, at least in the state house, a kind of a comeback. And um, so how does this play locally? I mean, how does the whole rejuvenation of the of the Democratic Party play in the local races? You know, I, I don't know about down ballot for Hawaii. I, I mean, Brian is not up for re-election, but uh, Hirono and, and Case and, and Takuda, and they're going to win in landslides on Saturday. There's no question. There's no governor's race. Rick Blangiardi is looking at a cakewalk in the nonpartisan mayoral race. Different story in the Big Island. But I will tell you, in some of those House races, particularly on the west side of Oahu, where Republicans have made inroads, there are some very competitive races. Not necessarily, they even have contested primary races mm -hmm. for some of those. And I think you will see um, as it goes forward to the general, I mean, that's where they've really been winning. And it's more conservative. It's, there's more retired military out there. There's more, I would say, religious. Uh, elements up there too it's it's just a more conservative area and very different than hawaii kai or 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 uh, kind of Kona. but but you are i think you are seeing some uh, and they're learning and they're and they're getting better at it and i will just say this some of those folks absolutely embrace donald trump a, a guy like diamond garcia who used to work for gene ward and now he's in the house as well uh, very much uh, is a follower and a supporter uh, of the former president. And, uh, but, you know, I, I do agree with Jay, everything did change with, with Biden stepping down and Harris coming in, but down ballot, I don't, I don't see too much with the national to the local. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Chad. I, I, I don't think that it's really going to make much of a difference. Well, certainly not what happens on Saturday. I think we're looking at very low voter turnout. I mean, from the numbers I've already seen coming in, there's just no real excitement around the Democratic primary, because the offices that normally drive people to the polls 
in our primary are not that competitive with the exception of the Big Island mayoral race. I mean, there are some competitive legislative races, but like Chad said, you know, Rick Blangiardi, I fully expect he's going to win outright um, tomorrow night. Um, I mean, his biggest competition is June James, who's a community activist. But I mean, I think she has even said in the press that one of the reasons she ran was simply because she felt like somebody should be running against Rick Blangiardi. Um, and so those those high level campaigns, the spending behind them, you know, the the, the voter mobilization um, efforts, that's one of the things that drives people to, to vote. And we just don't have much of that. Let me throw a curveball to somebody. Anybody can grab it. You know, if would, I, I agree that Blangiati will probably get it elected outright, which means he'll get over 50 plus one percent of the vote. And um, in the old days, you would have been uh, watching uh, the first question that would have been appearing in many people's minds are what happens to the next governor's race? Does the mayor step up? You know, and uh, I don't know. The mayor has, has said that he doesn't have any plans for a higher office. He is in his mid seventies and he's in great health, but I, I've, I've not seen that indication at all. And, and as you know, it's governor, the only mayor I think that made it, to governor is Linda Lingle. And even then it was a pretty tough, do I have that right? There was yeah, other... she was the only one and she was from yeah. the neighbor island. She was, and even then getting a neighbor yeah. island person elected governor as well. I will tell you there definitely are one or two candidates already planning to run against Josh Green. I'm not gonna name any names right here, but- uh, <laughs> Well, yeah. if you if you wanted to, you know you could because it would oh, really I know. help I, all, I'll come back to uh, my, uh, uh, help all ratings. But, you I, know, but I, I, I'm, I'm certain, but then again, this has really been quite a, you know, we'll see. It's been really not even two years for for Josh Green, and it's really quite a lot that's happened following COVID. But no, I um, it will not be. I mean, right? Didn't they make that? Cur it was the Frank Fossey law. They changed it, right? That if you're going to run for governor, you have to resign as mayor. And I sometimes wonder that. Yeah, it was the Frank Fossey law that caught Mookie Hanneman. I think. Yeah, <laughs> yes, in his yeah. sixth year, you yeah. know, when he was he was. Uh... Thought he left us with a with a with a system that was going to be a, a, a transit system that was going to be completed when when he uh, when he took the new job. But so the Big Island's got a race. Anybody got any ideas what's happening there? From the mayorship, Rock right. running and he's running against. I guess they. It's interesting, but uh, some of the natural supporters you would think. Uh, are not necessarily with him. I mean, he no, was the uh, boss. Yeah, Kimo Alameda, he's a medical doctor, I believe, by training. And, you know, not, not a medical doctor. Oh, I stand corrected. Thanks, Colin. Uh, and there are, I think, four or five other people in that race. And 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 there it is the same thing as a wall hole. You got, you got to get 50% plus one. I would imagine with that many people in the field, very good chance it'll be Roth and Alameda. But you're right, Governor, there have been some union endorsements that have not necessarily gone to the incumbent, as is often the case. Right. And 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 uh, Mitch Roth has had his own challenges. It's kind of hard to re remember this, but he actually had some medical issues mm -hmm. early on in his, his term as well. But that's definitely one to watch. Yeah, I, I well, agree. You know, you. Can I add this, John? Um, sure. I like what's happening in the Big Island. I like to see other new faces, new candidates, uh, new platform points. You know, if you raise new platform points, you're raising public policy issues, um, maybe that the uh, incumbent didn't raise. And so what you know what you've got is the, the real democratic process going on, and I am sad to say that uh, most of the races that I know of are are clear for the incumbent. The incumbent is there, will win, and there's a kind of a complacency about nobody else stepping up, nobody else taking the chance, raising the money, taking the risk. And I would like to see more of that. Well, I was just going to say, Jay, if I remember the last numbers I checked, the turnout or the voting so far is doing a little bit better on the Big Island that it is uh, on the other three counties. And in fact, there's a couple of, to your point, Jay, there's a couple of county council races that are also highly competitive. Governor, you have a Big Island background, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and yeah. I, I agree with Jay completely. How nice to see democracy actually happening uh, there on the Big hey, Island. You know, the Big Island is a very interesting place, uh, in my experience, because, you know, it's... Um, <laughs> It's like two places, right? You have West Hawaii, uh, West Hawaii and East Hawaii, just like, I guess, this island as well. But 
more so there in there in the corner side of the uh, of the uh, island it seems to be um more prone to vote uh, anti incumbent you know and uh, and therefore they have this reputation for voting for republicans in, in the past but um actually they they're also that side of the island is also full of a lot of retired uh retirees who happen to be quite liberal in their national politics it was always interesting to me to see how they voted on the presidential side and then who they voted for in in, in the uh, local races but it, it's not there's a kind of um uh a tendon, uh, an underestimation of the resentment of hilo <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, the hero gets everything and the rest of us get nothing and, and, and so forth and so on. And there's some truth to that. You know? I mean, you build an airport in Hilo when all the tourists are going to uh, Kona. And, and in Kona, yeah. you have holes opening up on the tarmac. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and so what do you do, you know? And, and, it, and it helps when, uh, you, you know, Hilo always is so loyally sending back Democrats, you know, I, I guess, and so, but there's some interesting things going on even in the House. I mean, they got the uh, what's his name? Did the, the, the Hamako Coast rep passed away recently? I'm not and, Nakashima, Mark Nakashima. Although yeah. it's looking like Dwight Takamine might very well get appointed back to his original. <laughs> yeah, state. so I mean, all of a sudden you I, get the return yeah. of ILWU. You know, so what um, I'm learning more and more about the Big Island, not to dwell too much on it, but in many ways, it it really is becoming. It's more than just two areas, east and west. You know, you really have Waimea area to the north. You have Puna to the to the south, uh, southeast. Yeah, uh, Puna nobody liked. I mean, it was sort of his own world. You know? But it's the fastest growing, and it's it's rural, but it's diverse. And it's I mean, got it's, the fantastic. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, uh, it's got a fantastic community network. It's, it's right. So, so I'm place. seeing some changes there, and I would also just add there are some definitely to that retirement point on Kona. There is a pretty good conservative element there in in Kailua mm-hmm. Kona as well, and they have actually elected some Republicans. Over the years, not as much as, as say, uh, other Republican, if we can even say Republican strongholds, but but it has to overturn seats a lot. A lot of different faces come in. Josh Green is. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't that how Josh Green got his start? Yeah. 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 Yeah, From (laughs) Kau. Right. And uh, and and then there's the council races, uh, which are interesting because. Former Republicans, former using the term loosely because, you know, just because they now have to run as nonpartisan, seem to do well at the county council level. Right. And, and, and I think they're learning the, this. Yeah, it's encouraging to see that kind of competition. I wish it was a little more lively here on Oahu. We really only have one. Actually, there's only one council race that's really competitive, right? It's Esther Kiaina on the... More yeah, like, I mean, yeah, that's it, it looks like Scott Nishimoto is probably going to dominate his his race. Yeah, yeah, that's my district. So, <laughs> so yeah, Scott, uh, uh, and uh, Scott, uh, how what's it like for the the race that he left? The, his well, house race. Now I know the Bert Kobayashi race is definitely open widely. There's there's five or six people. Because I, I want to be careful, the districts are close to each other. It's basically Kaimu Key down to Waikiki and Diamond Head area. I don't want to get them mixed up too much. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. His, uh, uh, Nishimoto's is uh, is uh, District 23, right? That's, right. that's the Ili Ili Macaulay district. Right. Is that Ian Ross? And is that's Ian one? Ross and Ikaika Olds. Yeah. Yeah, but you're right, Governor. Those two, two open house seats, fairly close together. Uh, but to With see- a lot of Democrats, I mean, young and up and coming Democrats, these yeah. are not uh, candidates that that are just sort of, you know, perennial. No, yeah. they're, they're new people, fr- uh, people with different backgrounds, uh, although some have connections to local government. Others are, are activists. Those are races to watch as well. Of course, fundamentally, if Scott Psyche wins or loses his seat, uh, if he loses, the whole speakership is up for grabs and the whole the whole tenor of the, the House of Representatives, as well as the leadership of the state, is at stake. Well, you know, it, it's it's very interesting. Uh, maybe, Jay, you can talk about the, the number of progressives 
they're the quietly getting elected. Uh, the, the Gary Hooser crowd, you know, and Gary's out there uh, running his, I don't know what do you call it, Pono Academy or something. Uh, the Hapa yeah. Huli, I call it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's a good one. That's a that, that's a good one. Half Huli. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. A... <laughs> Great yeah. Now, well, any comments about that? Gary, or... Gary was always um, on the left side of the progressive scale, right. um, an activist, if you will, even way back when. But but I want to offer this thought. You know, the, the change to Happy Warrior on the Democratic National has to have some effect on the on the thinking of people in this state. Whatever their original position was, this, you know, we've seen the oxygen sucked out of political thinking everywhere in the country by what's going on in the national election and the, and the name calling that Trump does and all that. So many issues. And I don't know about you guys, but I get emails at the rate of 500 a day uh, asking me to support this or that candidate from anywhere in 49 states, 50 states. So, um, you know, I think the oxygen has been sucked out. And a lot of it is, you know, bad news in the sense that Trump has been a bad guy. However, when you change to Happy Warrior, there are these, first of all, young voters, recently qualified voters who would say, hey, I, I don't want to be complacent anymore. I want to be involved. I want to be involved nationally and maybe locally, too. And maybe I want to run for office. I want to be a happy warrior, too. Uh, so I think, you know, although it's only two weeks old, it may have an effect over the next, say, three months or more uh, to activate young people in our state or people who are not otherwise well, uh, interested in politics to come off, come off the benches and actually play the game. That's one thought. The other thought, and I, I put it to everyone as a rhetorical question, what happens as a result of this national election? If it's Democratic, you know, landslide, a blue wave, I'd like to see that myself. Um, how does that affect Hawaii? Um, do we have a blue wave too? Do we have more of this um, activation of, of, of possible Democratic candidates and voters? And what happens if Trump wins? I mean, whether by voting or by suppression of uh, opposing votes or by insurrection, if he gets back into the White House, how does that affect local voting, local voters, the balance, the oxygen, so to speak, in our local politics? It's a rhetorical question. Well, it's a good rhetorical question. And, and it also implies that uh, that you that you might feel that some of the, the, we, the younger voters may start getting a little bit more interested in the race. Uh, or at least in the general election. Any thoughts from uh, either of the other panels? I mean, I think Harris' entry in this race is certainly going to boost our voter turnout in in the general. I mean, just overall, I mean, this will happen in Hawaii. It'll happen throughout the country for for Democrats and for young people. Um, I mean, I think my my own students were very, very negative about this election when, when, Brian, I mean, when Biden was still in it. And so I, I suspect that this will this will boost turnout across the board, um, just because there is a lot of excitement now on the Democratic side. Um, I, you know, what? Well, well, let me stop there and see if see if anyone else says. Well, you know, it's interesting. J.D. Vance was supposed to have done that. He's only thirty nine years old. You know, Kamala Harris is fifty nine years old. Uh, Tim Walz is is sixty. <laughs> and now, of course, what's happened is Donald Trump has inherited the unfortunate mantle uh, that Biden was stuck with, that he's too old. And you're hearing where I hear the word unhinged more than anything. Uh, and I also hear dementia and so forth. And something does seem to be happening in his response. He's getting all the bad attention that Biden got for the gaffes and the facts, factual errors. Now it's coming out from Trump and, and there's no one else to deflect to because he is, he's 78 years old and he has become the party of the age. So yes, Colin's right. It is exciting people. I mean, I mean, there are there are musicians that are uh, coming out in favor of, of Kamala Harris. You're having these memes and TikTok videos and so forth, evoking uh, her whole thing about falling from the coconut tree. So, so <laughs> it becomes such a big, but how rare, how unusual. You can't even think of something like that with Joe Joe Biden ever happening. Uh, and so that's that is exciting to watch, just from a nonpartisan point of view. That's very 
it's, it's thrilling to see this become exciting. Here's an interesting, a couple of other interesting races. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I haven't paid much attention, although I, I initially began by supporting him. But uh, I'm hoping that uh, Clayton he returns to the to politics, and and that might be a great race to watch on on the uh, windward side. Uh, yeah. in the general. Any That's, other races that look like they could be like that? Let me mention something about Clint, the Clayton He race. So that's District 23. Um, I think that I think he'll probably win, but Ben Schaefer, who is his competitor in the primary, um, has some strong endorsements, HSTA. Um, you know, he, he has pretty deep connections into the community. The, the former senator from that district endorsed him. So I'm not sure Clayton he's going to necessarily run away with it. I do think he'll win. Um, but I think that that's a more competitive primary than than people may have thought initially when they heard that, that Clayton was getting in. Really interesting. Yeah. Now, Chad, you got any? Well, and, and, and to be clear, I know, I know, Governor, that he's a friend of yours and that you're supporting him along with two other former governors. That's a funny district. It's physically, geographically, a Leonard or either the top or the second or third largest district. And it's not just the windward side. It's really from Kaneohe, I think all the way down to Mokuleia, right? It really goes to so a lot of diverse communities. Ka'ava, uh, Ka'u, not Ka'u, that's the big island. Um, Ka'u. La 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 I mean, that's enormous. Which is an interesting concern. Clayton did lose uh, one time. He actually lost to Gil Riviere, who at the time... Was he running as a Republican? I can never quite remember because Gil no, oh, The thing I'm most interested in is that uh, I looked at his numbers recently, and Clayton has had to lend himself a great deal of money. I've never seen such a large amount of money. Meanwhile, Brenton Awa, the Republican incumbent, he's got zero. And you know how he ran that thing, won that thing four years ago? He walked door to door to door to door. Again, a huge geographical district. I would love to see a Clayton he, Brenton Awa race, though. Two Native Hawaiians. I think that would be great. Yeah. I do too. Two, two pretty outspoken and opinionated candidates. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I and actually we should be thinking more about the good of Hawaii, but it would be fun to have a race in Hawaii that would be uh, fun <laughs> <laughs> for the people watching, you know, and, and that might be it. Well, another interesting, you know, this is another interesting situation, not necessarily race, but the return of Kai Kahele. Uh, for OHA and what that might mean for the future, you know? Um, and obviously, the, the the amount of time and effort that people are putting into the, um, on OHA for the uh, Kali'i Akina race. Yeah. Yeah, the at-large seat is really one to watch. And Akina, who is conservative, um, libertarian, I guess you could say, but really he comes from a very different background. And I, I believe Peter Apo, uh, former mm -hmm. Peter Apo is in that race. Uh, they, they are who Isa. There's someone yeah, else. Isa, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty contested race. And and I can't wait to see how that turns out. But with Kai Kahele, you know, it was just two years ago the guy was running for governor. Remember, he didn't, I don't think he actually called Josh Green and congratulated him after the primary. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah. I know early on after that, was it just two years ago, the governor's race, Kai also said he was going to, you know, he would essentially come back uh, in 2026 to run. But now I think he's realized he, that's not the way to go. Uh, he's trying to rebuild, uh, safely doing it on the big island. That's where he's from. That's Mililani Trask seat. And, and she uh, has. Worked him. Yeah. So I think that's how you rebuild a career. He's still very young, very charismatic. He's tall. You can never underestimate height being a factor. <laughs> Not always the case there, but um, you know how interesting. The thing about OHA, though, even though anybody can vote in an OHA race, even though it's a statewide race for all nine trustees, although I think only four or five are up each year, uh, nobody votes. The OHA turnout is the lowest generally just about any race they they just leave it blank they they didn't well that 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 you know that helps some people obviously helps and and, but i think it helps Kelly it, because it, his it constituency too. is yeah. probably the most cosmopolitan it, exactly i was going to say the same thing and as i recall when Kelly ran the first time some of a lot of his posters said everyone can vote for oha i mean he really was trying to recruit um, a, a broad spectrum of the population to to support him. He, he labels himself OHA's watchdog. 
Um, you know, and given how crowded this race is, I expect he's going to win, not just because he's, he's the incumbent, um, but because I think there are, that race in particular is going to draw people well, who don't normally vote for OHA races. Let's do a follow up on that, though. You mean win outright? Oh, no, win? probably not win outright. No, no, no. So, but probably be the top vote getter. Yeah. He'll be the top vote getter. And then what's going to be fun is going to be watching the um, the general election. Yeah. If any. Yeah, because, um, you know, one of the interesting people in that race, I think, is this uh, Z. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Z, some young young guy Suriaki? who was. Is it Suriaki? I may have the name wrong. Uh, but in any event, that he was a, you know, a real strong activist at one point, went to work for OHA and now is talking about bread and butter issues. So we'll see how you know, all of that goes. Um, Jay, any any last interesting things happening locally that you'd like to throw in a mix here? Yeah, Kali'i has been a, has, had been, because we, we cut back our shows a couple months ago, but uh, he was a, a host for ThinkTech for a decade. Um, and uh, he got more and more sophisticated in his treatment of issues and guests and events and so forth, and his own publications uh, at uh, Grassroot Institute. And so uh, I was increasingly impressed. And I know he, you're right, Chad, he is kind of on the conservative side, libertarian. And if you look through his written materials, that you see that pretty quickly. Um, but, but the fact is, he articulates platform points. Mm -hmm. And he's consistent about it. You know what you're getting with him. Um, and that, that makes him special in terms of OHA because he's he's there as a regular feature. And uh, I have appreciated, you know, what he has done in terms of participation in the public conversation. So I think that alone, whether you agree with him or not, that alone makes him a very worthy candidate. But let me add this, John. I have received over the past two weeks since the ballots came out a, a number of telephone calls. Uh, from people who had said, who are these people? Who, who, who are this crowd? I don't know these people. Who should I vote for? Then I find that very interesting because I think that's a general area of, what do you want to call it? It's a, it's a, it's a vacuum as to whether people know these candidates or don't know them. And, and I think complacency rules. If you don't know the candidate, you're more likely not to vote. Um, so I think OHA has a problem, and OHA and the candidates for OHA have to find a way to get out there. Yeah, well, uh, do they really have a problem, or is that the same? It's the same amount of knowing the candidates, uh, the knowledge, candidate knowledge, exists in all, in all, in all equally in all communities. Because the, I, I know for uh, for a lot of uh, Native Hawaiian constituency the, the loyal oha voter types they they know who's running uh i think what makes Le one of the interesting things issues maybe and i'm be looking forward to seeing how it plays out would be the involvement of the churches the the religious uh uh involvement in elections in general and how that plays off in the, in the OHA votes. Because a lot of the, uh, surprisingly, what, uh, what I learned from the last few elections, especially talking to Diamond Garcia, is that a lot of the support base for the West Side came from the, the, the Hawaiian churches. And so, um, so they, they, the, the two natural constituents may be uh, Leisa, who does have, uh, whose brother actually ran as a Republican lieutenant governor candidate and probably was carrying the social agenda before Trump that Hawaii needed to turn back some of these things. And, uh, and Kelly. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be sort of. Um, yeah, I think, I think Leahu Issa's brother is a pastor, is he not? Uh, yeah, he's a lay, well, he used to be a judge, but he's also like a lay pastor. Okay. And, and, and uh, you know, it's interesting how, 
and maybe we can just discuss that for a couple of minutes, and then I, I guess it's just about time to to call this quit. But the the involvement of the uh, religious community, even in Hawaii, in some of these issues. Now, in the past, uh, a lot of those uh, voters were pretty much uh, blue collar, bread and butter, oftentimes members of a, of a union. But still very religious, and but the, you know, religions, religious involvement used to mean hands off uh, of uh, any kind of you know real social. I, I don't think that's the case anymore, and particularly on the west side and others. I I don't want to paint too broad a brush, and we could talk about religion in Hawaii and politics for a whole nother hour easily. But but the New Hope churches, the more fundamentalist mm -hmm. churches, they are more aligned with conservative values. I mean, you still have the Mormon Church, very significant. Uh, not just in IEA, but also very consistent in terms of social issues. Uh, and then there's still a very strong Roman Catholic uh, church here as well. And you're seeing not just Hawaiians drawn to that, but Filipinos. And it is. And the Filipino voters are very much cons yeah. as Catholic. Yeah. And I, and I think uh, that is, it is a factor. They are not as passive as you indicated as they used to be. And, and, they're, and some are talking about it from the pulpit. And, and and we'll have a very interesting competitive race that's about that. I mean, Elijah Purick, uh, who's a state representative, is very open. I mean, I believe he's a he's a pastor. I'm very yeah, he's a pastor, in the evangelical right. community, um, and that's going to be a very competitive race um, in the general um, because I I believe it's Corey Rosenley who's um, likely to be yeah, the, the, the union the, leader, right? Uh, yeah, the union leader. Yeah, HSDA. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, any last words and of advice for? Uh... Anybody out there? <laughs> it's not, you, you can still vote. It's not too late. So if you're just hearing about the primary tomorrow, you can still do it. And please vote on time so that guys like Colin and I can get to bed at a reasonable hour tomorrow night. <laughs> yeah, so that we can go out and bed. Jay, any less? Uh... Yeah, I was uh, concerned to find out from HPR that the legislature gave $3 million for a recording studio. I'm sure to a moral certainty, Chad, uh, that you didn't put $3 million into a recording studio. This was for a, mid, a middle school. Um, and I, you know, I thought that was really amazing. And then to find that the legislature also gave this huge tax cut that it's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And all the while, we have to recover Maui. And that, yeah. that lawsuit, the, the $4 million settlement, is not going to recover Maui. It's going to have to be the state and the taxpayers. So to spend that kind of money on a tax cut is really strange. And finally, and finally, we have climate change. And every day, you know, they say at the School of Journalism in UH Manoa, it is the biggest story of our lifetimes, climate change. And it overrides everything. And so query, is the state prepared for that? If the state is spending hundreds of millions, you know, on a tax cut, Will it have the reserve, the resilience to deal with extreme weather and so forth? So I think those considerations, for me, putting it in perspective, overarch everything. And I and I really hope uh, that the electorate in Hawaii is familiar or becomes familiar with those priorities. Thank you, Jay. You may have laid the foundation for our next show. But <laughs> and we appreciate all. I want to thank Colin. I want to thank Chad and obviously Jay. For uh for joining us this morning and again you know jo joining in with their uh, uh encouragement that we all go out and vote no matter what and uh, exercise the franchise so aloha everybody thank you for watching and thank you for uh, being a part of Think Tech Hawaii aloha. <laughs>